Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Jamie. My pronouns are they, them. I am the Programming and Outreach Coordinator for Adults for Fort Vancouver Regional Libraries. I'm very excited this evening that we're hosting Ryan Miller with the uh, Washington State Department of Ecology's Nuclear Waste Program. Um, this is the first program in Fort Vancouver Regional Libraries series, Revolutionary Reads. Um, tonight, Ryan's going to be talking to us about Hanford, the myth versus reality. I just want to let everyone know that this is part of our annual Community Reads program, Revolutionary Reads. The book we've chosen for this season is Atomic Days by Joshua Frank. Um, and this is part of several programs we're hosting throughout the rest of the month. The majority of our programs will be at the end of May, early June. Um, and just so you're aware, Revolutionary Reads is now in its uh, 19, 20, 20, in its fifth year. Um, and it's our annual community reads program and the goal is to galvanize the Southwest Washington community to read the same book on a topic of revolutionary importance. Um, this program for this year is focusing on the Hanford site, which is located on the Columbia River, and we're looking at the past, present and future impacts the decommissioned nuclear production complex has on the people, places and environment in Washington. Um, so our program series, which you can find on our website at fbrl.org slash revolutionary reads. Um, all of our programs this year are virtual or have a hybrid option. So tonight is our first program. Um, the next one program we're doing is at the end of the month on May 30th, we'll have a virtual program where you can meet and discuss the Atomic Days book, which we're currently giving out for free at all of our library locations. So you can stop in there and pick up a copy and then join us virtually on May 30th at 6.30 to do a discussion of the book. Um, the author, Josh Frank, is gonna be there to discuss it with us. And then Monday, June 5th, um, we have Robert Franklin from WCU Tri-Cities who's going to be talking about the social cultural history of plutonium production. On Tuesday, June 6th, the Columbia River Keepers and the Yakima Nation is going to be talking about Hanford and the River. And then we do have an author visit with Josh Frank on Saturday, June 10th, which at 3.30 p.m. And that's going to be in person at the Goldendale Community Library, which is our easternmost location in Fort Vancouver and the closest to the Hanford site. Um, and that will be hybrid as well. So you're welcome to join that as well. If you're located in Clark County, I did learn that the Kiggins Theater in downtown Vancouver is actually hosting a film screening on Wednesday, June 7th, right in the middle of our program. Um, and Joshua Frank is going to be speaking at that event as well. So if you're in the Clark County area, that is another opportunity for you to meet the author in person. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, but this evening, we are meeting with Ryan Miller, who is the communications manager for the Washington State Department of Ecology's Nuclear Waste Program. He oversees program communications, outreach, and public involvement activities, informing and engaging the public about one of the most complex nuclear cleanup sites in the world at the Hanford site. Prior to working at Ecology, Miller was a news reporter covering a range of topics, including energy, agriculture, education, crime, and government. He has a bachelor's in journalism from the University of Kansas and is finishing a master's degree in digital content strategy comprised of certificates in social media strategy and data interpretation and analysis. All right, let me go ahead. Okay, so um, again, my name is Ryan Miller. I'm the communications manager for the nuclear waste program at the Washington State Department of Ecology. I know that's a, that's a mouthful and we'll get into uh, kind of the role of ecology versus you know, the, the Department of Energy and other agencies involved at the site. Um, but essentially, the Department of Ecology is a regulator, and we, we kind of oversee the cleanup of the Hanford site. Um, so as we begin, why don't we talk about uh, location? So um, our office, uh, for those of you familiar with the Tri-Cities area and, and kind of the Hanford site, is, is the Hanford site situated right along the Columbia River. Um, and and so our office is is if you guys can see my mouse it's it's right there uh, in the middle you can see there's WC Tri Cities and kind of North Richland is all these houses at the bottom of the picture and if you look a little more north north of the ecology office uh, there's what's called the 300 area at the Hanford site where they did a lot of kind of research and and that kind of work and then there's um 200 area which we'll get in we'll get into what all this um, work was but and then 100 area this whole area that rides right along the river. That's what they call the 100 area. That's where all the reactors were. Um, but I'll go ahead and get into our next slide here. And all right, so initially, sorry, my slides are not syncing up here. 
Okay, so over in the Hanford site area during um, you know, pre-1942, which is 1942 was about, you know, the World War II time and when they started um, actual work on the Hanford site. But before that, Hanford was, was you know, it wasn't a site. Hanford was made up of, of a series of, of small, you know, villages and towns, including the town of Hanford, uh, the town of White Bluffs. There was, of course, Richland. But even before that, you know, the there were tribes that, that you know, lived along this area and, and you know, um, have, have traditional, you know, lands and use that they used. Uh, uh, over the years, um, you know, hundreds of years before, you know, anybody else that even got there. So the, the tribes that um, that that were in the area was the Yakima Nation, uh, the Nez Pierce tribe, and the Confederate tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. There was a, another tribe uh, called the Wanapum, and they actually were the they actually lived right along the river in the Hanford site area. And um, and then as you can kind of see in the other picture there, there's um, you know the, the, those com communities of Hanford, White Bluffs, and Richland were largely you know small agriculture communities. They only had a few thousand people living in them at the time, and you know they just did a lot of apples and and other fruits and that kind of work over in the Hanford area, or what is now the Hanford site. And initially, um, the Hanford site was almost 700 square miles in size. Um, you know, the site ended up being a total of 586 square miles. And uh, so, so, you know, that's about half the size of, of Rhode Island. And, and when the federal government was trying to find a site for plutonium production for their nuclear, weight, uh, for their nuclear weapons program during World War II, uh, they were looking for an area that had three big um, three big kind of, of needs. One of them needed an adequate water supply. The other one was it had to be kind of isolated and, and you know, away from a lot of, you know, huge population kind of centers. And then the other, uh, the other, um, uh, the other, the other big need that they needed was access to, you know, electricity. And so they, they kind of, you know, I think the story was, was they're flying over the Hanford site and saw the and saw it and just when we're just like, this is just a perfect area because you have the, the massive Columbia River that flows along it provides a lot of, you know, a lot of you know, fast flowing cold water. There was the, you know, the dam, the Grand Coulee Dam that had reliable electricity. And it was also a, uh, you know, it was also not a lot of huge population centers at the time there. There was the couple small little towns and villages, and we'll get into what happened to them in a minute. But um, so there wasn't any big population centers and it was, it was more isolated and was just this big massive site that, that, did, that they decided to pursue for, for the Manhattan Project for the production site. Um, so over at the Hanford site, when they decided that they wanted to do the production on this land, they gave the residents of, of those communities 30 days to vacate their homes. And so in total, it was actually about 1,500 to 2,000 people were vacated from their homes over in Richland, Hanford, and the White Bluffs farming communities. They're all forced off their land. Uh, they were given what was called fair market value at the time for their home. We actually found some some receipts over the years and 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 the reality wasn't quite, you know, fair market value for many that were kicked off their lands. They were just given kind of a check and told to get off, you know, thank you, get off. Um, and then of course, you know, the tribes were were removed from the lands without any compensation. Um, and so so you know the Hanford site was kind of rooted and and they you know they cleared out the space. They also tore down all the old buildings of the of the old towns and villages that were down there. And and the only there's only two buildings that still stand today from the initial towns. One is the White Bluffs Bank of Hanford, and the other one's the old Hanford High School. But even those buildings are both kind of stripped down to kind of their foundation. So that's the only two buildings you'll see on site. Um, and there's also a couple, um, you know, there's some dead like uh, agriculture trees that are kind of hanging around in the area too. But for the most part, everything else from those towns is is just just non-existent anymore. Um, let's go ahead and go to our next slide here. So when they constructed the Hanford site, they needed a bunch of workers and they recruited from all across the country, but they, they really pulled a lot of the labor from the South. Um, the, the average during the World War II, you know, early construction years, they had about 50,000 workers and, and those workers were housed in a variety of areas. They were housed in dorms on the site um, uh, for, you know, more of the single folks. They had uh, what was called a Hanford trailer city on the Hanford site. It was like a trailer camp and it had uh, I think at its peak, it had about 6,500 to 6,800 um, uh, trailers that were all in the Hanford site for families. And there was also houses for officers. And they also built some fabricated housing um, in you know, the relocator Richland that was south of the Hanford site. Uh, at its peak, there were about 55,000 workers at the Hanford site working there at one time. Uh, I went, and going back to housing, was housing was segregated by gender and race. 
And, and while there wasn't you know, official work segregation, the jobs and skill sets on the, on the Hampered site were segregated. Uh, the housing segregation also included, you know, recreational activities and stuff outside of outside of work. So, you know, there was a lot of segregated like entertainment, like, you know, like dances and social events and stuff like that. And a lot of the uh, African-American population over in, um, you know, that were the so workforce, there were a lot of them were relegated to live in Pasco versus Richland or Kennewick when they eventually you know, started building those towns south. Uh, so, there's, so there's just a lot of segregation that kind of, you know, turned the Tri-Cities into what the Tri-Cities is today. Uh, over the course of World War II, the Hanford site employed, you know, over, they hired over 165,000 workers, but again, the, that number usually hung about only about 50,000 at a time, and that's because the turnover was pretty high at the Hanford site, and a lot of that was due to, you know, harsh weather and living conditions. Um, you know, a lot of folks, they moved up to, to the Tri-Cities and discovered that, you know, there was really, really nasty windstorms sometimes, and at the time, there was a lot of really bad dust storms that happened up there, and, and there's also really hot summers. And a lot of those families, you know, they, they lived in these trailers on the Hanford site that didn't have AC and they were, you know, really cramped in these in these living quarters. So it was really, you know, tough living conditions. And so a lot of, there was a lot of turnover, you know, due to that and some other, um, you know, concerns like the, like I said, the the other living conditions and then just the weather um, and, and just, you know, the nature of construction work. So over the Hanford site as well, as if you look at the pictures at the bottom right, that's just a, just a couple chefs that were cutting up some meat, but there were a total of eight dining halls on the Hanford site and each dining hall did three meals a day. So it resulted in, you know, thousands of meals a day that just resulted in just an insane amount of crazy food statistics. If you go to the, the natural, you know, sorry, the, the, the B reactor tour over in Tri-Cities, you'll actually see these placards up on the wall where they've got all these um, food facts. And just a couple, just to share with you guys was, you know, there were 700 cases of Coke were consumed daily. There were 15 tons of potatoes that were used daily at each mess hall, which, you know, amounted to more than 120 tons of potatoes that were eaten each day at the Hanford site. And there were, um, you know, another fact was there was 250,000 pounds of meat that were used at all eight mess halls during each week. So just some insane food statistics. And it was actually, you know, the, at the time, the Hanford site was also the largest single voting precinct in the United States. Um, just goes to show you, you know, there was so many people living there and so many people working on site. It was, it was just a very, you know, very kind of robust, you know, population for a while there, especially during the construction years. All right, so we're going to kind of shift back into to the construction of the Hanford site. Uh, if you look at this picture, this is actually the, the front face of the beer reactor, which was the world's first full-scale plutonium production reactor. Um, and, and so during, you know, Hanford, it was, it was the largest, not just Hanford, but the Manhattan Project was considered the largest public works project in history. And it might, might very well still be, but uh, this, this B reactor that I'm showing you guys, that was one of the first, you know, main buildings they built on site. And it was, again, the, the first full scale plutonium production reactor, you know, in the world at, at, at the time. And it, it was built in just 13 months, so, you know, just a little over a year, which is pretty insane for a, you know, for a reactor, and, you know, for this kind of a project that's never been done before, but they built it in 13 months. And while it was built in 13 months, you know, 95% um, of employees didn't, did not even know what they were working on. So only 5% of the workforce, and we're talking about, you know, the super high level, like uh, the super high ranking officials, they were largely the only folks that knew exactly what they were building. Um, so, so only 5% knew what they were building until the, you know, until the bombs were dropped in Japan. Um, and so again, this photo shows the front face of the B reactor. Uh, the B reactor building is actually, it's now a national monument and they have tours that you can go into and, and you can actually go in and visit the B reactor. You can actually walk up to that front face of the reactor that's on the picture there. And, uh, so they just reopened tours a couple months ago after kind of a COVID-19 pandemic delay. And so you can actually walk in there and check it out. And they have, have some really cool, you know, history that you can check out. Um, and we do recommend that you guys go out there and check it out if you're ever in the Tri-Cities area, because they have a lot of docents that, you know, they used to, th those docents that that do the tours, they used to actually work out on site, and a lot of them were there for some of the initial Hanford years, and they're just a wealth of knowledge and and just really good information. Um, let's go ahead and go to our next one again. So um, it wasn't until headlines ran, you know, after bombs were dropped that that the people of Richland and the Tri-Cities and, you know, the Hanford workforce, you know, 95% of the workforce knew what their contribution was to the war. Uh, you know, the plutonium and the Nagasaki bomb and the Trinity test, that was um, that the plutonium from those two bombs came from the Hanford site. Um, Fat Man, the other bomb, or sorry, not Fat Man, the one that was dropped on Hiroshima was 
um, that was used with other materials from other sites. Uh, but Nagasaki Trinity test used, you know, um, the Hanford site kind of production. And then kind of shifting into the plutonium production years, uh, this image, I believe this image is of the B reactor complex or one of the other reactors on site. Um, but the, you can see just how massive these, these um, sites where they had a bunch of towers, there's the smokestacks. Uh, if you can see my mouse, I'm circling around the building in the middle. That was the actual reactor building and it had all these supporting, um, all these supporting facilities. And if you look at this bottom right image, uh, there were a bunch of these tanks that were used to house the worst of that nuclear waste from plutonium production. Um, and just as a, as a quick kind of primer, uh, when they're when they're trying to produce plutonium, they have they stuck you know the uranium rods into the reactor, and then let the rods get irradiated. And then, and then initially, then they pushed out those rods out of the back of the reactor, and then and then those were taken to a bunch of uh, what was called uh, plutonium processing facilities or canyons. And, and so they, they were bathed in chemical baths. And so, you know, a lot of those chemicals from those baths and a lot of that radioactive material, a lot of that was put into tanks, um, those tanks in the picture. And I'll get more into some tanks in a little bit. Um, but there were 177 tanks that, that they used to store waste. Um, but in total during the production years, which again was the end of World War II through the end of the Cold War, um, there were a total of nine plutonium production reactors that were built at Hanford. And, um, you know, and I do want to say that much of the site is uncontaminated. Um, and, and I'm going to clarify again, I said uncontaminated because, uh, as I said earlier, the site was a total of 586 square miles and a lot of the actual facilities on site. Um, I forgot the exact number, but I think it was between 10 and 25 square miles of, of actual kind of facilities and, and kind of hampered stuff out there. Uh, the rest of it was used, you know, as a lot of security buffers. Um, and just, you know, to, to keep the population away from Hanford. And they also separated the areas. If you remember that picture I shared at the beginning of the presentation, they had the 300 area near Richland, they had the 200 area in the middle of the Hanford site, and then they had the, the 100 area along the rivers, or along the river, sorry. So um, uh, there, a lot of the nuclear reactors were up along the river because they had to be right next to a water supply to cool their reactor. Uh, all the reactors on site. The middle of the site was where they did a lot of the actual processing of the uranium and plutonium and actually made it into the pucks, um, the, you know, the plutonium pucks that was on an earlier slide. And that 300 area was used for a lot of kind of research and some other kind of work. And so the, the intention behind, you know, having those areas of the Hanford site so far apart from each other, but connected by rail was, was that if there was some major catastrophe on one section of the Hanford site, that it would only impact one section of the Hanford site and not the whole site as, as a whole so that they could still you know proceed with the mission and proceed with their you know, with their production efforts and there'd be less of a hit as far as as far as you know damages and stuff so that's part of the reason why why one the site's so big two why they spaced out all the major sections of the site so much and then again three um, a lot of the Hanford site is just a lot of security buffer area and, and just protection so a lot of the site again is was uncontaminated um, and, and in total, during the production years, Hanford made about 65%, which equates to about 74 tons of the nation's plutonium for nuclear weapons. And uh, so the remainder was made at Savannah River over in, um, over in South Carolina. Uh, uh, so the total cost of Manhattan Project um, totaled out to about $1.9 billion, and about 21% of that was spent at Hanford. So the Hanford site during the, you know, during the Manhattan Project years cost a total of about $400,000. Um, that's 1946 dollars. That, that price tag is, is about $6 billion, you know, today dollars. Um, but, you know, if we're looking back during the production years, as I kind of hinted at, there was a ton of um, waste that was generated, a lot of contamination that was made. And so the processes used to create plutonium also just resulted in, you know, the creation of huge amounts of radioactive and chemically contaminated waste. And, and we'll go over a variety of that waste in the future slides. But um, as I said, as I, as I said about the processing facilities, there's all these chemical baths that were used and it created a lot of really nasty, you know, radioactive and mishazardous chemical waste. A lot of contaminated groundwater from the reactors and other facilities was created. Um, just a bunch of other contamination and, and stuff was created during the production years. And, um, you know, the, like, so the work, a lot of the production work at Hanford was done through about the mid 1980s. And that was when an inspector raised concerns of, of safety and lack of safety in the plutonium finishing plant and also of, you know, improperly stored disposed uh, materials, um, which kind of led to the tri-party agreement, which, there we go. 
So the tri-party agreement was signed in 1989. It was actually, we're coming up almost on the anniversary. I think it was about May 16th or May 15th, 1989. And the tri-party agreement, it provides the legal framework for how the how agencies will work together on hampered cleanup and schedules. And the three agencies involved with the tri-party agreement are the U.S. Department of Energy, the Washington State Department of Ecology, which is my agency, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And so in a nutshell, the work that these agencies do is is that the Department of Energy, they they um, they manage the Hanford site and they they take care and they actually do the actual cleanup on the Hanford site. And the Department of Ecology and the EPA, we do, uh, we're both regulators, we partner as regulators and we oversee energy's cleanup and make sure that they're following, you know, cleanup deadlines, that they're following, um, you know, the, the stipulations of the tri-party agreement, as well as some other legal agreements that have been signed over the years and, and just making sure that, you know, the work is done in a safe and effective way. Uh, so as you can see on the slide here, there's a couple of laws that that kind of work with Hanford. One of them is called RECRA, which is the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. And the other one is the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, um, uh, referred to as, as CERCLA or Superfund. So, um, so ecology has authority from the from EPA under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act to enforce uh, to enforce that act. So ecology, we, we regulate the more of the toxic mis, mixed hazardous waste of, um, aspects of cleanup and EPA focuses largely on, on radioactive waste under CERCLA, which is the other law that I mentioned. Um, again, that was the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. Whew. Uh, just big, big acronyms. So again, as you can see, the uh, the we also have a permit which is called the Hanford Sitewide Permit, and that outlines conditions for the treatment, storage, and disposal of of, of all the waste you know on the Hanford site. Um, and actually, uh, a fact that we kind of like to share with this picture is you can see uh, Christine Gregoire here. She was a former Washington State Governor. Uh, she was actually the first director of the Washington State Department of Ecology, and also Ecology was the first environmental protection agency in the country. And we were we actually predated um, the the EPA by a couple months, so we actually we actually were in existence before the EPA was. But, uh, anyways, this picture shows representatives from Ecology, from DOE, and EPA. Uh, so the the US DOE manager at the time, Mike Lawrence. Um, if you guys see this this broom in the background of the picture. Uh, you can see it, it says uh, Hanford Tri-Party Agreement, May 15th, 1989. So those brooms were given to all of the signees of the Tri-Party Agreement. And Mike Lawrence actually told Christine Gregoire back at the time that she could ride her broom home, take up for what we will. But that broom is actually, it's on display at the Hanford Reach Museum in, in the Tri-Cities, um, along with some other really cool resources about Hanford site history and, clean, and current cleanup work. All right, so cleanup really began in earnest starting after that that tri-party agreement was signed, you know, in the 1990s. Um, so, you know, what does cleanup kind of entail? You know, it looks like tearing various facilities down to the smallest footprint possible. You know, it involves cleaning up contaminated soil, breaking down buildings, you know, pump houses, other facilities. Uh, you know, cleaning up all those areas. It also removes, you know, a lot of the the um, a lot of this debris and material from these buildings and other sites that are put into this big, huge landfill called the Environmental Restoration Disposal Facility, or ERDF, which we'll talk a little bit about kind of waste disposal in a little bit. Um, but, you know, as, as cleanup has been kind of undertaken, there's been some interesting kind of discoveries. If you look at this top right picture, there is a, a colony of bats that has kind of called the F reactor um, home, where they actually... Uh, they actually roost around the 100F area clear wells, which is just a facility that that used to connect to the reactor. And there's also they also live in installed installed bat boxes near the F reactor. And there's also an overhang on this this reactor building here that that the bats actually they 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 roost under. And that's kind of where the picture you see on the top right. That's one of those uh, bat colonies that live that lives there. But if you can see this bottom right picture. Uh, compared to the left one, you can see that the, the the left picture has got these big, huge stacks falling. There's, um, you know, you can see a lot of the staircases and stuff on the facility. And then that bottom right picture, you could see that it looks largely kind of, you know, cleaned up and it's kind of encased in this enclosure. And we call that process cocooning of the nuclear reactors. Um, and so that process is meant is is that they is that they demolish as much of the facility of the reactors as they can to get it down to the smallest footprint possible, and then they cocoon it into this um, what they call interim safe safe storage because they have to let the reactor um, they have to let the core of the reactor decay to safe enough levels so that they could that they could dismantle and dispose of them at a future date. 
um, which is, I think it was 70 to 75 years that the reactors have to sit there and decay to save enough levels for, for eventual permanent dismantling and disposal. Um, and we will go ahead and go on to our next slide again. So, uh, you know, the, the largest nuclear cleanup site in the world is, is also the most complex nuclear cleanup site in the world, and it poses a lot of cleanup challenges. Um, you know, during the production years at Hanford, there were few and kind of sketchy records of, of, of what was done on the site, you know, where waste was disposed of. Uh, a lot of that was due to top secrecy and also just poor record keeping at the time. Um, so after that tri-party agreement was signed, the regulators, uh, they, uh, so us and EPA, they were out on site and we inventoried everything out on site with the Department of Energy and we ended up listing about 2,400 um, waste sites on the Hanford site. We also found there was about 80 miles of contaminated groundwater beneath the Hanford site. Um, there were 56 million gallons of waste that was stored in 177 underground tanks. And 149 of those tanks are single shell tanks and the rest are double shell tanks. And I'll get into um, the tanks again in a few slides. And of course, there were also you know, hundreds of contaminated buildings out on site. There was the contaminated soil. Um, so just a big, a big environmental mess that needed to be cleaned up. Um, so, so a lot of the, you know, a lot of the dumps and contaminated soil was dug up and moved to a properly designed modern landfill. If you look at that top right picture, that that kind of shows that uh, you know some some of the waste barrels and boxes. So a lot of those, that kind of waste was actually just dumped in online trenches on the Hanford site and just covered with dirt. So it wasn't you know any official kind of landfill. So so a lot of those sites that's that's included in that 2,400. Um, you know, areas that I, that, I, that I just talked about. So, so a lot of that work that they're doing out on the Hanford side is digging some of that up, you know, taking care of that waste in a proper way. Um, and then when I touched on uh, groundwater during the nuclear arsenal production at Hanford, there was an estimated 440 billion gallons of wastewater that was created. Um, and all of that water was, it was mostly dumped or injected into the ground in cribs, which are covered open ground waste filtration beds. They're also, the water is also um, dumped, you know, just into pits, trenches, um, I should say online trenches and injection wells. Uh, so the wastewater also sometimes overflowed as it moved from, you know, reactor buildings and processing facilities for tanks and other storage areas. So, so there were, again, there were 440 billion gallons of wastewater that was created and, and, and released into the environment. And there actually used to be these big, huge ponds out on the Hanford site that was just this contaminated groundwater. And then eventually when they started, when they stopped, you know, just disposing of water and just dumping it, um, it eventually just seeped in. And so those ponds don't exist anymore. And then go to our next one. So other cleanup challenges, um, there's, you know, the federal budget is a huge concern. Uh, historically, since cleanup began, Hanford has basically been underfunded by the federal government almost every year since, since Hanford cleanup began. And the current total cost for the Hanford cleanup is estimated uh, between $300 billion on the low end, $600 billion on the high end. And this was from the Department of Energy's life cycle report that was released a couple of years ago. Um, so again, sufficient funding is an issue. You know, we're regularly seeing the federal government under, underfund Hanford by more than a billion dollars a year. And, and kind of the, the, the basic part of this matter is, is when the Hanford site is underfunded, cleanup takes longer. It, it, you know, every, I forgot what the exact figures were, but it was like every year that Hanford is underfunded by a billion dollars adds a couple extra years to clean up. So essentially, you know, we're seeing cleanup delayed by decades. We're seeing the ultimate cost balloon by extra, you know, tens of billions of dollars. And also, you know, the longer cleanup takes, the higher the risk of, of a kind of a catastrophic contamination release or infrastructure collapses. So a lot of the work that my agencies have been doing over the last year and a half has been trying to plus up the funding at the Hanford site and really get at the funding it, it deserves, um, you know, so that we can keep cleanup on track. Because, you know, when, when Hanford is underfunded, the Department of Energy, they have to prioritize the work on site. And so they have, they have you know, they have work that takes priority and then the work that you know, is further down the priority list just doesn't get done as, uh, as as quickly because there's just no funding for it. So that's why it's important to get you know hampered funding at the right level every year. Otherwise, we'll see those costs balloon and and the the timeline increase. Um, you know, another kind of uh, aspect that needs to be you know navigated is is the tribal treaty obligations. There are three tribes that I mentioned earlier. There's the Yakima Nation, the Nez Pierce Tribe, and the Umatilla. Uh, those are the Hanford Treaty tribes. Um, the Wampum, like I mentioned, they're they're actually one of the bands of the Yakima Nation, and they didn't sign a treaty uh, back in the 40s. Um, but but 
all these treaty tribes all have rights on the, the you know the ceded lands at Hanford and have the right to fish at usual and custom places. So so the Department of Energy does a lot of um, you know government to government consultation. We do work with the tribes um, and and various um, regards. So we work with them closely in Hanford cleanup. Um, and and when I'm if I'm going back to the funding allocations is is just an example is of our efforts over the last years. Last year for fiscal year 2023, we actually saw the Hanford budget request or the Hanford budget allocation uh, number total out at $2.84 billion, which is an all time high. But that number was also, again, it was almost 700 to uh, 700 million to a billion dollars short of what's needed. Um, this year, we just saw the president's budget request come out. He actually requested an all time record high in funding of $3 billion. But that amount is also, it's about $700 million short of what's needed to keep work on track. So we're seeing a lot of really good progress, um, you know, with the congressional delegation and with the, pre and with the presidential administrations that come through office. Uh, but we still have a lot of work to go to, to kind of, you know, get hampered the cleanup it needs, as well as the other um, cleanup sites across the country. So how is cleanup work done on the Hanford site? So... The U.S. Department of Energy and their contractors, they plan the work, you know, they have plans that they'll share with, with the regulators, so, you know, ecology and EPA, so we review those plans, you know, we give them the thumbs up or we say no, you know, there there's needs to be some things that need to be tweaked on it, so we approve the plans, and then the Department of Energy and its contractors go out and work and they actually execute the plans, we oversee the work to make sure it's done, again, you know, according to, to those federal laws, as well as, you know, the, the tripartite agreement and all those kind of, um, you know, agreements and laws that are in place. Uh, after the work is done, the U.S. Department of Energy reports that work to us and, and the public as well. Uh, we check the report. We also modify recommendations and we can request further work if, if needed. Um, and then after the work is done uh, and, and even before the work is done, we also do a lot of compliance work. So we go out and do inspections on the Hanford site to make sure everything's looking okay. Um, and, and just make sure you know the work, cleanup work is progressing. Uh, workers on the Hanford site, they're actually very specialized and kind of carefully trained and there's continuous monitoring for radioactivity and contamination on the Hanford site. So if a hotspot were dug up and it set off radiation alarms, um, you know, the drivers uh, might have to be changed out or they might have to wear PPE, sorry, a, a personal protective equipment. Um, everyone on the Hanford site that does this kind of cleanup work, they do, they, you know, they wear a personal dosimeter. Um, so worker exposure is limited and there's radiation monitors out on site. The, the Department of Energy, as well as our partners at the Washington State Department of Health, they do a lot of monitoring of, of you know, the air, the river, just to make sure that contamination isn't, you know, there's no big releases of contamination. Um, that's kind of a, a quick rundown of how the work is actually kind of done on the Hanford site. So where does waste go at Hanford? There's a lot of waste at the Hanford site, and, and this is apart from the, the groundwater I talked about, as well as the tank waste. Um, and when I talk about this kind of waste, a lot of that is, you know, the, the, the debris from contaminated buildings, a lot of those kind of containers that you saw that were in those online trenches. So a lot of that waste goes to what's called the Environmental Restoration Disposal Facility, which is this big, huge landfill on the Hanford site, which you can see on this image here. Um, so ERDF, which is the acronym for it, uh, it's a large engineered landfill in the center of the Hanford site, and it's used for the disposal of low-level radioactive hazardous and, and mixed waste that are generated from cleanup activities. So this landfill consists of 10 large disposal cells that cover about 108 acres, and there's a waste capacity of about 21 million tons. And over the years, it's been expanded a few times with more of those disposal cells. And today, more than 18 and a half million tons have been disposed of um, at this facility. And so the, the landfill is also designed to meet state and federal standards as opposed to that waste that was disposed of during plutonium production years. So this, this landfill on the Hanford site, it's got what's called geosynthetic lining. There's a leachate collection system for liquids and water. Um, there's also going to be eventually a, a, an engineered covered and cap that's supposed to go on top of the of the landfill when it's you know when it's done and it's uh, when it's full and that will direct moisture away. And I want to go back to that leachate collection system I, I mentioned. So the leachate collection system catch, catches you know extra rainwater and just um, you know kind of water and other fluids that that you know might seep out of equipment and stuff. And and so that leachate collection system catches all those liquids. And then the Hanford site workers, they actually treat it at another facility separately. So we're trying to avoid, you know, getting more waste and contaminated, you know, fluids into the groundwater. And speaking of groundwater, here is a kind of a, a general conceptual model of kind of how groundwater contamination kind of works. Uh, you can kind of see here that, 
you know, the different types of buildings and facilities on site. You know, we have like the reactor buildings, the cribs, ponds, trenches, the tanks, uh, and kind of how it can get to the groundwater and, and also um, just kind of moves along. And I mentioned this figure earlier, but there's an estimated 440 billion gallons of wastewater that was created. Uh, and again, that was, that wastewater was dumped or injected into the ground in those cribs, you know, pits, trenches, injection wells. Uh, contamination historically reached the river during production years. Um, less so now. Uh, groundwater is the top priority. Um, the original contamination plume underneath the Hamford site was about 80 square miles. That number has now been reduced down to about 60 square miles. And I'll get into how they've done that um, again in a couple of slides. Um, so the Columbia River boards the Hamford site. Uh, as you can see on some of the maps, um, and we'll get to a picture again soon, is, is for about 50 miles. So when some contamination, so some contamination does get into the river today, it's in small amounts, but it's so quickly diluted that the river uh, does remain a class A water body, water body that's, you know, that meets surface water drinking standards. Um, you know, there's a, there's a term I think that, that my coworker Ginger uses, which is like pollute, or dilution is the solution to pollution. Uh, you know, don't always agree with that, but some of the contamination that does get into the river, it's the water, the Columbia River is such a huge water body that it just dilutes so fast. Uh, but we are doing our best to make sure that, you know, contamination doesn't reach the river and it's being treated and disposed of. Um, and let's go ahead and go to our next slide, which is on protecting the Columbia River. So as I kind of mentioned, that groundwater, um, that contaminated groundwater plume that's been reduced by about 20 square miles, a lot of that work has been done through what's called the pump and treat. There are five pump and treat facilities on the Hanford site, and these facilities are you know, placed um, along the river as well as in the central of the site. And what these facilities do, they actually, they actually extract contaminated groundwater from beneath the soil. They treat that contaminated groundwater, um, and then they re-inject the clean water back in. Um, and so they use that to treat it, and they've treated more than 30 billion gallons over the pump and treat project so far. And the last number I had was that about 700 tons of radiological and chemical contaminants have been removed since that groundwater treatment program began, which was in the 1990s. Um, in addition, like I said earlier, there's a lot of monitoring that's done of both the groundwater and of the Columbia River. There are about 3,000 wells on the Hanford site that are in use. That are in use. About 1,000 of those wells are sampled each year, um, totaling about 4,400 sample sets. Um, there are also more than 300 aquifer tubes along the Columbia River that, that officials sample every year. Um, and they also do uh, the, the river pour water sediment and river water are also sampled routinely to make sure no big contamination is getting out into the river. And, uh, uh, you know, some of the, the fish and wildlife are also monitored regularly just to make sure, again, that continued monitoring I talked about. And if you ever, if anybody ever wants to learn more about that, that groundwater um, monitoring as well as the river monitoring, uh, there is an annual report that that is put out called the annual Hanford Groundwater Report. It's it's available online for anybody that's interested in checking it out, and it kind of details a lot of the the you know groundwater work that's been being done and you know is planned and and the monitoring that's going out on out there. And if you look at this picture here, this bottom left picture is of the um, one of the pump and treat facilities. That's the one that's in the central area of the site. And uh, this this picture just depicts one of the workers that was monitoring a fish. If you look at this overview site, this is in the White Bluffs area along the Columbia River, um, right near Hanford. And uh, so if you see these dots that are all along the river, these are actually the salmon reds or nests where the salmon, you know, drop their eggs and stuff. So they, they do a lot of that right, you know, in the, uh, over in this Hanford Reach area. Um, so the Hanford Reach is the only fall Chinook spawning ground on the mainstream Columbia. So it's, so again, it's vitally important that we protect the river in this area. So talking more about re removing contamination on the Hanford site, like I said, the, the pump and treat facility, it keeps some plumes from reaching the groundwater. And um, they also, what I didn't mention was that they strategically, when they re-inject that ground, that water back into the ground, they actually try and push it more inland. So they're trying to reduce the plume and get it more centralized at Hanford versus in, and they're trying to keep it away from the river. And uh, but sometimes, you know, just removing the constant source of contamination is the better solution. And, and one example I have is what was called the chromium dig at the Hanford site. So uh, there was groundwater in the vicinity of the 100D area, which is that's where the D and DR reactors were at the Hanford site. And officials discovered that there was, um, you know, there was hexavalent chromium that was contaminating the area. Uh, in the, uh, that 100D area, and it was actually found to be about 200 times higher than the drinking water standard. 
um, and the soil in the area was actually stained. And it was stained like a fluorescent green color with that chromium six from when rail cars were spilling it, as well as other um, contamination that got in. Uh, so the Department of um, Energy, we uh, EPA and Ecology, we finally got energy to agree to dig up the contaminated soil. It came at it came at um, after a bit of a fight because uh, energy usually likes to dig about to about 15 feet. Um, the reasoning is that we've heard is that you know with houses, their basements typically typically go no deeper than 15 feet. But you know as we're all aware, contamination can go far far deeper than 15 feet. But we we worked together closely with EPA and we we got them to go uh, got the the federal government energy to go after this this persistent source of contamination. And as you can see on the picture there, you can see that big blue kind of looking pond down there, as well as this this right image that shows the construction equipment. So the work that was done here, this, they ended up digging a hole that was about 85 feet deep and 10 feet deep into the water table, and they reduced the groundwater contamination in the area um, uh, significantly. So now it's only about 20 times the, the drinking water limit versus 200 times. So it's not perfect, but it's way better than what the situation used to be. Um, and and uh, another fun fact is by removing that hexavalent chromium contaminated soil in this area, and, um, and then um, concentrating on the pump and treat, the need for the pump and treat mission was reduced by about an estimated 34 years. So that just goes to show the importance sometimes of just getting at where that source of contamination is and, and just getting it out um, rather than just kind of putting a Band-Aid on the issue. And as promised, let's talk about some of the hampered tanks. So as I kind of covered earlier, there were 177 tanks at the hampered site that stored what was what's called kind of the worst of the waste. And the sizes vary on these tanks, but they average about a million gallons. There were 149 single shell tanks and 28 double shell tanks at Hanford. Um, there's 18 groups located in both the 200 East and 200 West areas on the site, which you can see on this, this right image, you can see these red stars. That's where those tank farms are located at. So the single shell tanks, they don't, they're not compliant. They don't follow you know, federal and, and state law for, for you know, storage underground. Uh, the double shell tanks, they have a steel lining, um, what we call an annulus, and then another steel lining with concrete and rebar. So that's actually a compliant tank. Um, so for an example, if you're at a gas station, they require you to have a double shell tank. And part of that's to help is that, that there's a leak that happens in, on the inner layer is that it'll, you know, the, the double layer still catch it and then they could take care of it before it leaks into the, into the, into the ground or the groundwater. Um, that being said, uh, you know, even the double shell tanks are well past their design lives. Um, all of these single shell tanks and double shell tanks at the Hanford site, they're, they were built with about a 20 to 25 year design life. And obviously they're, you know, some of them were decades past their design lives. So there's just these aging tanks on the Hanford site that are, that's holding this, this significant volume of waste. Um, and so, so over the years, you know, I think it was back in the seventies or eighties that they were found, they found that there was a lot of chemical buildup happening in some of the tanks and the tanks were burping is what they called it. Um, so they actually removed all of the pumpable liquids from the single shell tanks and put some sodium in the tanks to kind of neutralize it and to help and to help um, stop that. Uh, but a lot of the waste in the tanks we see today is again, a lot of these double shell tanks hold a lot of the liquid a lot of the liquid waste. A lot of the single shell tanks hold more of the salt cake, more of the sludge and the slurries and that really hard to to kind of extract and treat kind of a waste. Um, and and a lot of that waste is is, uh, think of it as the consistency of like a milkshake almost. It's kind of like a slurry. It's, so there's a mix of different types of wastes in there. Um, and so the tanks, uh, the majority of the tanks were about 45 feet tall and about 75 feet across. And I have a picture in a couple slides that just goes to show you just how massive these tanks are. But before that, we'll talk a little bit more about tank waste. So, so the, the picture here that you can see, this is actually the inside of, it's a panoramic view of the inside of a tank. You could see all the salt cake that's built up on the sides, as well as some of that, that nasty stuff in the middle. That's a lot of that's that, that um, slurry, that sludge kind of stuff. Um, so over, over time, there's estimated to be about 67 single shell tanks that I've assumed to have leaked at, at some point. Um, that being said, today, there's only two known tanks that are actively leaking. Um, and, and, and I said this number before, but all of these tanks, the single shell tanks and the double shell tanks, they store 56 million gallons of that mixed high level waste. And that's about 60% of the nation's total. 
Um, and so far, waste has been what we call retrieved from 20 of the 149 single shell tanks. And what a retrieval means is they go into the tank and they remove as much waste as they possibly can. Um, and actually, the number we have is is it has to be less than 3%. Uh, 3% is just the absolute maximum threshold because they have to go in, they have equipment they put into the tanks uh, to go in and spray it multiple times and just try and get that, that salt kick and all that stuff out. So, so when we say retrieved is that is that the very vast majority of waste from about 20 tanks has been retrieved and it's been moved to double shell tanks for eventual treatment. So that, way, that, that work continues to completely retrieve waste from, from the single shell tanks. And this picture is what is called the Hanford Cold Test Facility. It's actually located off of the Hanford site. Um, but this, this facility, it's meant to demonstrate, is actually representative of what a single shell tank is at Hanford. So if you see the walls here, you can see just how absolutely massive these tanks are. Um, this is actually our agency's director, Laura Watson, when she visited in June, she's inside this, um, this cold test facility. But you can see there's a walkway on top. So workers actually use this, this cold test facility to, to practice dropping equipment in and to do like dry runs and tests before they actually go out to the actual Hanford site and do actual work on the tanks. Because there's just so much really complex work that's needed um, to take care of that. Um, and let's go to our next slide again. So um, this picture is of the inside of a double shell tank, which is tank AY-102. Uh, this tank was actually discovered to have leaked in 2012. We actually went to court with the Department of Energy to get them to pump the waste out of this tank. Um, and so this picture shows what the, the inside of the, of the tank looked like before that waste retrieval began. Um, you can actually, it's kind of hard to see, but this dark stuff here, that's a lot of that waste that's sitting inside the tank. And this tank was actually supposed to be one of the staging tanks for the waste treatment plant, but we, we got energy to, to take the waste out of the tank and move it to, a, to another double shell tank. And then this tank is, was taken out of service. Um, uh, but just to be really quick is, is when we're talking about the tanks at Hanford, this, it's really complex, hard work to do because one of just the nature of the waste that's in the tank, but they also have to be really careful. You know, we can't have any humans get super close to this waste. So they use a lot of robotics and equipment to, to get in there. Um, they have what's called risers, which you look at, if you look at this picture, this is this is some of the risers in the tank, and they're and that's what they actually use to drop down equipment into the tanks. Um, so you know, and when they do a lot of, of of work in the tanks, they need to have a you know at least three different components that they drop in. They have like a the sprayer or the sluicer that that washes the waste and and, and extracts it. They have to have a light that goes in the tank, and they also have to have cameras to go into the tank that way they can actually see what they're doing and to help them do cleanup. Um, so some of the challenges associated with that is, is the robotics have to navigate a really complex environment. You know, they have to navigate through all these um, risers that are dropping down to the tanks, as well as, you know, the actual waste itself. Um, you know, the equipment, uh, another thing they have to be careful of is the equipment actually burning out from radiation in the tank. So they've got specialized armored lenses on the cameras to prevent kind of the lenses from kind of milking over. Um, they've also got a lot of other equipment they use. Uh, so again, they, they remotely take care of this stuff. They actually use, um, a fun fact I learned is they use PlayStation controllers, you know, from the video game console. They, 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 they kind of rig up the controller and hook it up to their, to their computers and they actually use that to control some of the robotics and some of the equipment that's used to take care of, you know, these tanks. And they also have what's called uh, crawlers that uh, they're actually these kind of small little robots that crawl up the sides of the tanks on the outside to go in and monitor it and do like laser scan or laser imaging is, and they also take images of the inside of the tanks. So there's a lot of really complex work that goes into monitoring these tanks as well as doing the work, um, the actual work inside the tanks. So this picture shows um, what, what that same tank from the earlier picture looked like for uh, after the waste was retrieved. You could see this is kind of a, a fish eye view of the inside. So you can see all of those risers that are dropping down into it. Um, you can see that you know the, a lot of the liquid wasters are moved, just um, leaving just the the very small little puddle at the bottom. Um, but yeah, so that's that's just what kind of goes into that. So they with with AY 102, they ended up removing more than 725,000 gallons of waste. About 590,000 of that was supernatant, which is kind of that that milkshake kind of consistency I told you about. And then there's about 135,000 gallons of sludge they removed. And that tank holds about 18,000 gallons estimated today. Um, so if we're looking at tanks today, the, I, I told you guys that there was two actively leaking tanks on site. Those tanks are B109 and tank T111. Um, we were notified by the Department of Energy in uh, April 2021 that B109 was discovered to be leaking. 
Um, this, this picture on the right shows what the inside of that tank looks like. So again, these single shell tanks all had um, a lot of their, what's what we call pumpable liquids removed in the 90s and 80s. And so a lot of the remaining waste is just that that sludge and that that kind of um, thicker kind of stuff that's hard, that's harder to remove than the liquid. Um, that being said, uh, there is about 15,000 gallons of what's called interstitial liquids, which is the kind of the liquids um, uh, between and amongst kind of that, that sludge and that salt cake and stuff. Uh, and energy has estimated that the tank is leaking about 560 gallons per year. Uh, about 4,000 gallons have leaked to the soil. Um, and that being said, there is no immediate threat to the public or workers. Again, this is, you know, you know the tanks, like I said, they're about 45 feet tall. So it's a, it's a, it's a little ways under the ground. Um, so there's no no immediate threat to the workforce or the public from the nearby Tri Cities, uh, but over the, the from the time of this leaking tank announcement up through about August last year, we worked with the Department of Energy on a path forward for for addressing actively leaking and future leaking tanks on site. Prior to this, there was actually no leak response plan for single shell tanks at Hanford, um, and this is despite there being a leak detection process in place. Uh, so under this this order that we agreed to with Energy. Um, energy is going to, they're covering both of those tank farms with surface barriers to, to kind of divert rain and snow melt from seeping directly into the tank. Uh, energy is going to create a response plan for, for responding to future um, single shell tank leaks if they were to ever happen. Um, so this is going to be the first site-wide single shell tank leak response plan. So we don't have to go and take it on a case-by-case -case basis each time a tank is discovered to be leaking. Um, there's also the, uh, uh, the other parts of the order is is they're going to evaluate the viability of installing a ventilation system to evaporate the the liquid waste that is remaining in the tank. They're also going to see if uh, to evaluate conditions in and around the tanks to determine if there's additional work that can be done to prevent liquids from getting into the tanks, which is what we call intrusion. Like I said, that snow melt and water that can get in. Um, and they're also looking at ways to accelerate the schedule to take waste out of those two le leaking tanks. And let's go ahead and go to our next slide here. So tank waste treatment on the Hanford site. Uh, there's something out, there's a big, a big um, complex out on the Hanford site that they've been working on since the early 2000s. It's called the waste treatment plant. And that's where they're gonna be treating all of this tank waste. Um, there's four major components to the waste treatment plant. One is called the pre-treatment facility. One is called the low activity waste facility. And the other is called the high level waste facility. And there's also an analytical laboratory um, as part of this process, but um, how the facility is supposed to work is that pre-treatment facility takes that tank waste and it separates it into low activity waste and high level waste. And then those two waste streams are supposed to go to their respective facilities I just mentioned. And then that's where they're gonna uh, vitrify or glassify, which is where they take the waste, they mix it with glass forming materials and turn it into a solid form. And then they stick that waste in um, in stainless steel casks, and then and then they get sent for permanent disposal. So, back in 2010, the treatment start date was delayed by eight years uh, after about three false starts and two delays in the current plan. So we've seen about a 23 year total delay in the waste treatment plant. Um, the pre treatment facil facility has been on standby. The high level waste facility is uh, the current milestone for treating waste. That facility is 2033. Uh, that being said. There is a, uh, the low activity waste treatment facility is actually expected to start next year. Um, they're doing this through a process, what's called direct feed low activity waste. And this is where they're taking waste out of the tanks. They're treating it in, the, in a system called tank side cesium removal. So they're, they're gonna be pre-treating the waste to separate the solid and cesium. And, and they're gonna send that remaining low activity waste directly to that, that plant and then start treating that waste. Um, so so they're, they've been working on getting that facility ready. The facility was actually originally on track to start uh, uh, late this year, but they started heating up the melters um, in October of last year and they ran into an issue with the electrical panel. So they had to cool down the melters and they've been fixing them and just getting them prepped to reheat them and to start the, the, the hot conditioning of waste treatment. And again, the, the current expected start date is 2024 for that. And they're on a pretty good track to, to finally start treating some of that tank waste. Um, and so the, the, the waste that is treated the low activity waste is going to be disposed of on the Hanford site in a facility called the integrated disposal facility. And then the high level waste is supposed to be disposed of off site at a deep geologic repository. So cleanup accomplishments so far, and I've got just a few slides and I'll be done. Um, so seven of the nine reactors on the Hanford site have been cocooned um, or, you know, uh, uh, had those protective closures built. 
Um, one of those two remaining reactors is the B reactor, which is that National Historical Monument now. Um, so that reactor is it's not going to be cocooned anytime soon. Um, they're working on the last reactor. Uh, in addition to the reactor work, you know, there's been about 14 million tons of contaminated soil that's been removed from the river shore. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they removed pumpable liquids from all of the single shell tanks. Uh, more than 1,350 waste sites have been remediated in the last, you know, 30, 40 years of cleanup. They've expanded the groundwater pump and treat, which has uh, decreased the contamination spread and better protected the Columbia River. Um, and more, more importantly, we've also um, improved um, and or developed records to better define the problems that we face and to create a plan. Um, so, you know, it helps define, you know, where these waste sites are at and how we're going to take care of it. So, so we have a lot more better records than, than we did back during the plutonium production years. And in addition to this, uh, of that 1,350 waste sites that were remediated, more than 900 facilities have been demolished. And, uh, uh, and then, like I said, about 30 billion gallons of groundwater has been treated. And if we're looking at the Hanford site, uh, again, it's 586 square miles of largely undisturbed habitat. Um, the creation of and security of the Hanford site, it left this area largely untouched and kind of protected it from, from development from, you know, like nearby communities. Um, so therefore, there's been, you know, hundreds and thousands of species of, you know, insects, birds, wildlife, um, amphibians, all sorts of other stuff on site that, that call Hanford home. Um, and so a, a major part of work at Hanford is, is making sure that the environment and the habitat and the wildlife are protected and, and you know, in a way that's safe for generations to come. If you look at just some of these images, you know, there's uh, porcupines, there's a big herd of elk that, that comes through the Hanford area quite a bit. You know, we've got um, the salmon, of course, like the bats I mentioned that, li that like to roost in some of the reactor areas. They've got some bald eagles um, and just a bunch of really awesome, fantastic wildlife out there. And, and uh, so, so that security buffer kind of ended up protecting most of this area so that we see the more of this natural habitat over there. Um, so I'll be quick on this slide. There was a law passed uh, a couple of years ago by, uh, by Washington State. It was called the Healthy Environment for All Act, which is uh, Washington State's environmental justice law. Um, the goal of the HEAL Act is, to, is intended to remedy the effects of policies and practices um, historically that led to environmental health disparities in, in overburdened and underserved communities, and, and it's meant to improve the health of all people in Washington. Um, that being said, is, is the Hanford site's a bit unique, where a lot of environmental justice concerns for, for cleanup sites come from, you know, communities that are that are kind of butted up right against like a like a like a contaminated site. Um, the Hanford site, it's got that that security buffer, so a lot of, you know, the vast majority of the population lives quite a ways away from Hanford. Um, that being said, is 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 um, there's still a lot of you know nearby communities that have historically you know kind of faced the brunt of 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 these practices that I mentioned um, a couple seconds ago. You know, um, like I said, Pasco Pasco has a largely Hispanic um, community. There's a big language barrier there where they don't have this. They haven't had the same historical access to information about public involvement and cleanup decisions that that the other Tri-Cities have historically. So um, a lot of the work that we're trying to do with the HEAL Act is to get out to those communities, make sure they're informed and are included in the decision-making process in a meaningful way. Um, however, one of the biggest concerns um, when it comes to Hanford is actually the Hanford traffic versus the actual Hanford site. You know, there's, there is 18,000 car trips a day along George Washington Way and the bypass um, that kind of go cut over the top and through Tri-Cities. And a lot of those, uh, you know, vehicle emission pollutions are actually more of a concern, a direct con immediate concern than, than, you know, the contamination of the Hanford site. So a lot of the work, you know, the Hanford Advisory Board, they, they're actually pushing the USDOE to work with Ben Franklin Transit to try and reinstate the kind of busing system to try and get more workers on buses to the site so there's less traffic on those highways and roads. Um, and so that's just some of the work that's being done out on site and related to environmental justice. And I'm happy to, to talk with anybody in more depth about this if they want it at another time. All right, and then the Hanford Advisory Board. The Hanford Advisory Board is a federally chartered advisory board that serves all three of the tri-party agencies. Um, what they do is they provide informed recommendation and advice to the agencies on cleanup. Um, and you know, we really do think that diverse thought and experience are critical to board decisions, uh, as well as, as you know, advice to the agencies and and to really kind of uh, you know get input from the stakeholders, public, 
um, you know, nearby communities about what's important to them with cleanup. So it's a really vital tool that that we that we get a lot of value out of to to hear those perspectives from the community. Um, fun fact: If you see me, there's actually a picture of me right there. Um, uh, so you know, public comment and involvement is also really critical to to the work we do at Hanford. Um, we do public involve you know public meetings. There's public hearings. We've got uh, public comment periods, and we really encourage everybody to reach out if they have any questions and to get involved with Hanford cleanup. Um, and, and historically, this Hanford Advisory Board, they've served or they've provided more than 310 pieces of advice to the agencies. And a lot of that advice has led to, you know, some changes and, and cleanup decisions and, and kind of tweaked some things and really has provided a lot of value to actual cleanup. And the board, like I kind of mentioned, they represent a broad swath. They, uh, there's actually uh, uh, the Oregon Department of Energy and the Oregon Hanford Cleanup Board have a couple seats on the on, on the Hanford Advisory Board. There's a lot of uh, uh, nearby communities such as Richland, Kennewick, Pasco. Uh, there's the nearby uh, counties. There's also environmental and special interest groups. So just a lot of really diverse kind of viewpoints and, and, and um, you know seats on the Hanford Advisory Board. As I kind of shared uh, during that slide is is you know we really would like to public you know you guys want we want you guys to to get informed and to stay informed and to tell others about the Hanford site. Um, you know if you look at that the slide we've got a link there it's ecology.wa.gov/hanford. That's our website that's got a lot of really awesome resources on it that that can tell you about Hanford cleanup. Um, and and there's also a really nice Hanford overview page. It's got a story map and like an interactive map you can check out. Uh, the U.S. Department of Energy has Hanford.gov, which has got a, a lot of really good resources and public involvement opportunities on there. Um, the EPA doesn't, they have a really nice website, but they don't have a really big dedicated Hanford website presence. So, so just kind of direct you guys to go to ecology.law.gov or Hanford.gov. Um, and again, we do host a variety of public meetings and, and other kind of uh, public involvement opportunities. Um, that Hanford site-wide permit that I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, we're actually going to be going out for public comment for that, that big renewal um, early next year. And we're actually going to be going across the state. We're going to be going over to the west side of Washington, up to the far east side of Washington. We're going to be going down into Oregon and, and doing some public meetings and hearings to, to one, inform the public about, about the site-wide permit, and then also to get their feedback on that permit before it gets issued. Um, so that's one of the upcoming opportunities uh, that's going to be pretty significant that we'd love feedback on. All right, and uh, one of the last parts here is is we have a series that we started during the early uh, during COVID years called Let's Talk About Hanford, and we pursued these um, in an effort to still do outreach and education during the COVID years because of the restrictions from the pandemic. So we did these um, only all virtual events where we, we do a dual stream where we get on Zoom and then we dual stream with the Facebook and we present on one kind of over, overall Hanford topic. We have a guest speakers that come on and we, we do a over, kind of overview on that topic for the, for the night. And then we have um, a Q&A session with the attendees where they can ask any questions about that topic. Um, so, you know, for, for some examples, we had a really great habitat and wildlife event where we had officials from the Washington State um, Department of Fish and Wildlife and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, where they talked about wildlife and habitat at the Hanford site. We had Robert Franklin from the WSU Hanford History Project. Do he, we have, we've had him three times to talk about early Hanford history, um, later Hanford history, as well as as well as the history of African American segregation and resistance at the Hanford site in Tri Cities. Um, you know, we've also done presentations on the compliance work we do at Hanford. We've talked about just the general update, looking at the year of work that we've done. Um, you know, we talked about Hanford geology with some guest speakers. So a lot of really good topics. And there's a QR code here that if you pull out your, your phones, you can actually scan it and it'll take you to YouTube where you can actually view the recorded version of these events. You can go back and watch them. And we've got about, I think between nine and 12 uh, total recordings on, on, on our YouTube channel now, which if you just go to YouTube and type in Washington State Department of Ecology, um, if you click on the channel, there's a Hanford section. You click on the Hanford section, you can watch all these recordings that are on there. And also we encourage you guys to follow our social media. We have uh, uh, our Hanford um, office has a Twitter account and a Facebook account. You can see Washington Department of Ecology Hanford and Ecology Hanford, ECY Hanford. We do a lot of uh, uh, posts that show, you know, fun facts, trivia from Hanford's history. We focus on some current public involvement opportunities, you know, job postings, um, public meetings that are coming up, news releases. 
Uh, so definitely encourage you all, if you're interested in learning more about Hanford, to check out these two channels as well, that YouTube channel I mentioned. Um, and of course, uh, Ecology has a bunch of other social media channels if you're ever interested in the rest of the work Ecology does across the state, because Ecology does far more environmental work than just the Hanford site. Um, and with that, I think that's actually uh, the end of my presentation, but I, I do want to thank thank um, you all again so much for having me today, especially especially Jamie, thanks for having us on today, and I'm happy to take any questions if we have time for it. Sorry if I, if I ran a little long. No, that's great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all the information you shared, and I do want to also put in a plug in for Let's Talk About Hanford. I've actually sit in on a couple of those sessions, and they're really great, so I really do encourage them if anyone's interested in learning some more about the site. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat or from anyone online. Um, if anyone has a question, we'll hang out for a couple of minutes. Um, otherwise, thank you everyone for being here. And um, please take a look on the library's website to see what other programs we have coming up about um, Hanford, so. Yeah, and if anybody does have any questions that, that comes to their mind after you leave, you can always feel free to send us an email. Our email address is just hanford at ecy.wa.gov, and, and that's kind of a catch-all for my team. So um, we respond to any and all emails we get. So if anybody ever has any questions, feel free to reach out to us. I have a question. Yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, I'm a little overwhelmed by all of this, but I did catch something that you said, uh, the, the one of the uh, reactor B yeah. is still unencapsulated and mm -hmm. it's, it's where you would actually be able to go and see that wall that you showed in that one slide. And I'm just going, how is it not contaminated? <laughs> Yeah, and that's a good question. That's a question I, I still need to go in and dig in and see how they've done it. They they do, it's it's obviously to a level that's safe for the public to go there, otherwise they wouldn't have done it. But they're actually, uh, my understanding is when they, they were actually going to go, Energy was going to go and they were going to close up the B reactor as well as the rest of the sites. But there was a huge effort that, went, that was underway by the local community to try and preserve it because the B reactor, again, was the first full-scale plutonium production reactor, reactor. So it's a really kind of critical part of history. So there's a lot of effort to preserve it. Um, so I know when they did that preservation work and they got it passed as part of the Manhattan Project, you know, National Historical Park is they did a lot of work to go in and and they did clear they did still go and clear out a lot of those supporting ancillary facilities and they cleared out um, you know made it safe so that the public could go and attend it. And my understanding is if you look at the actual front face of the reactor, um, and I'm not sure how accurate this is, but it's actually the back end that's more of the 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 end of concern, I guess you could say, because again, these this is a huge brick of graphite. And so the front of the reactors where they just took the tubes and stuck the rods in um, and then they popped out the back. So, so obviously they have it to a degree that's safe for the public to go and tour it. And they, they, um, they did remove all, all, all the significant contamination and stuff there. But um, that's a question I had too, and I'm still learning, learning about it. But uh, yeah, and if anybody's interested, you can go on um, the, if you just search like beer reactor tours on Google, you can go and sign up and do a tour. And I actually did one back in 2019 and it's super, super informative. You can go on, like I said, you can see the reactor. They also have a bunch of other rooms you can check out and you can see how the reactor kind of worked and all the history that went into it. And it's just super fascinating. Yeah. What a mess, but mm -hmm. I'm so glad it's, you know, becoming less so. So thank you very awesome. much. Yeah, thanks for your question. Yeah. There is a question in the chat. How many years do they anticipate cleanup? Excellent question. Um, so currently, if Hanford is, is funded appropriately, the current estimates are putting Hanford cleanup into the 2070s. Now, that being said, I do want to say that if Hanford consistently gets underfunded, we'll see that deadline pushed back because, um, the, the again, the, the overall cost will increase and the, um, the, the timeline will increase just because they have to, you know, push some work back. But that's the current estimate is, is if, you know, Hanford's funded, it'll, it'll probably be about the 2070s, late 2070s is the current estimate. There's a question, because um, you did mention that, that some of the high level waste will be going out of state. Do you know where that will be going? Excellent question. So the, the, so again, the high level tank waste that is vitrified, you know, put in a, in a solid form, put in the stainless steel casks, they're going to be disposed of in a deep geologic repository. That being said, a deep geologic repository hasn't been identified or created yet. 
So for the interim period until that's decided and, and created, um, not only for Hanford, but for other sites across the country that have this high level waste that need a deep, deep geologic repository is, we're gonna have to store that waste interim on site until that's defined. If any of you have heard about Yucca Mountain, that, that was originally supposed to be the deep geologic repository and it's been put on pause on and off again for many years and it's, it's that project's kind of become dead in the water. So that's a, pro that's a problem that has still yet to have a solution. Um, but with the federal government and, and whatever state they work with decide the deep geologic, deep geologic repository, I, I guess we'll know the answer. Great, well, thank you so much, Ryan. We're getting some thank you in the chat. I really do appreciate you taking the time with us this evening. Um, this is a really great primer in terms of since we head in more into this topic and I really appreciate you um, providing all this information for us. Um, yeah. So with that, we will go ahead and end tonight's session. Thank you so much to everyone who's able to attend this evening. Thank you especially to Ryan and the Department of Ecology for all your work. Um, and we hope everyone has a great evening and hope to see you at a future program. Awesome. Have a good Thank night, you, everyone. Thank you, everybody.